welcome to the eighth annual Multicultural Marketing Conference. Here to welcome us today is Trenda Boyambreen, Vice President for Student Affairs. Please put your hands together. Thank you, Cecilia. Are we on? Great. Good morning. Cambio. Cambio is the word for change in Spanish, and change is definitely in the air. The face of our country is undoubtedly changing rapidly and dramatically. As, democratic, uh, as demographic and societal changes take shape and increasingly become part of the national landscape, embracing the growing diversification of voices is unquestionably becoming more important to our future. Consider this, the U.S. currently ranks as the second largest Spanish-speaking country in the world behind Mexico. President Obama, our first African-American to be elected president. Sonia Sotomayor is the first Latina and third female to be appointed to the Supreme Court Justice, as a Supreme Court Justice. And President Obama recently took a historic stand by endorsing same-sex marriage. Go Obama. <laughs> and just last week, new census figures show that for the first time in US history, babies of color are now 50.4% of all the nation's newborns. It's pretty amazing. Also reported last week in an article entitled State of Change, published in the St. Paul Pioneer Press, was the fact that our state of Minnesota, a state that is overwhelmingly white, is increasingly becoming more diversified, currently having 17% people of color, and according to the state demographer, from 2000 to 2010, our state grew by 380,000 people. Interestingly, 85% of those people were people of color. In the demographics of the new America, people of color are quickly becoming the majority, both nationally and locally. They currently make up 37% of the nation's population, and it is predicted that they will become the majority by 2042. Unquestionably, current and future leaders, especially those in leadership roles in the workplace, need to prepare and truly understand the change that is taking place and transforming our country. What does all of this mean? Are we keeping up? Will there be a new multicultural mainstream? Do we have the knowledge base and the tools necessary to face new challenges as we go forward? Part of today's conference explores the final results of the 2010 census and, pre and presents a preview look at the multicultural populations in our country. The conference is designed to provide insights, marketing strategies, cultural awareness, and economic contributions of the Latino, the GLBT, Asian American, and the emerging US African markets, some of the fastest growing markets segments in the US today. On the back side of your conference flyer is a quote from Metropolitan State University President, Dr. Sue Hammersmith, and she states, quote, Metropolitan State University is honored to host the 2012 Multicultural Marketing Conference. As a comprehensive urban university, we are deeply committed to educating tomorrow's diverse, world-class workforce. We regularly work with our region's employers to better understand the emerging roles in their organizations that will provide opportunities for our diverse graduates and to build their careers in the years ahead, end quote. On behalf of President Hammersmith and the entire university community, I welcome you to Metropolitan State University and wish you an enlightening and very enjoyable conference. Now I have the pleasure of introducing you to the President and CEO of Aguilar Productions, Mr. Rick Aguilar. Aguilar Productions is based in St. Paul, Minnesota, and is the leader in promoting the emerging markets to corporate America, producing marketing conferences and special events with a focus on the Hispanic, Asian American, African American, emerging African, and the LGBT markets. Founded in 1997, Aguilar Productions has presented the leading multicultural marketing experts in the US, 
Many Fortune 500 companies have sponsored these conferences and special events. Very active in civic affairs, Richard served as chairman of the board of directors for the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce for the year 2000. He was a member of the St. Paul River, St. Paul River Center Board of Directors and served on the board of directors and led the diversity committees for the Red Cross, the Girl Scouts, and the St. Paul Winter Carnival. He just completed an eight-year term on the Metropolitan Council, being appointed to that position by Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty. Aguilar Productions is a member of the Association of Hispanic Advertising Agencies and a certified, Minnesota, uh, certified minority business enterprise and member of both the Minnesota and National Minority Supplier Development Council. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Rick Aguilar. Rick, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, it's very exciting to be here in the hood, right here in <laughs> on the east side. And uh, you know, it's, it's, and it's remarkable. Yesterday evening, we had a reception here, and we were looking uh, on, on the beautiful uh, uh, deck there, and then we we're looking over the city. And it was so appropriate that we have the conference here because St. Paul is now 50% multicultural. St. Paul, Minnesota. And it's, it, it seems like it's happened so suddenly. And uh, so I thought, you know, this, this is important to, uh, as we bring this program in here to uh, Metropolitan State University, that um, I think we're at a point now where, where we're talking about a business case. You know, diversity, uh, for many years, was the right thing to do, and, you know, we should be doing that. But now I think the numbers point to uh, taking a leadership role. And this is a business case. This is, this is an opportunity where as businesses are looking for new markets, just open the door and look around the corner because the, the, we're here. So that's, the, that's the really the, the opportunity we want to present uh, here uh, this morning. And uh, one of the things that we, we've always been very uh, pleased with and, and, uh, and very fortunate in many ways is, is we've had sponsorship uh, for all these years, 16 years uh, uh, this year of presenting this programming here. It's been a, an exciting ride for me personally, uh, having thought that uh, this would be very welcoming to present this kind of information here in the Twin Cities. Because you know, we, we, sometimes when you live here, you overlook the fact that we're a leader in corporate America in Minnesota. A lot of innovation, a lot of great products and services have come out of, of this state, and, and you're part of it. I mean, everyone in this room is, is, is going to be part of that leadership. You're, you're going to leave this conference today with a lot of new ideas. And don't forget in your, in your goodie bag there, we do have a CD-ROM with every presentation today. Take it back to your offices to share it with your associates. Uh, that's, that's really the idea so that we, we, you've got that information. But uh, our sponsors have been just tremendous, and, and I want to mention them. But and here's why they're tremendous. I think they're... Uh, if you go to all these conferences that are in other parts of the country, they don't have that sponsorship. And I'm just pointing out one of our, one of our great friends, U.S. Bank. And, and so U.S. Bank's message is multi, multicultural marketing is a necessity if you're going to grow your business. So they sponsor this event, and they welcome everyone. They welcome their competitors. Come and learn about this. And I think that's... That's kind of uh, what makes a Minnesota a leader, where you have sponsors that are willing to share the information, willing to be part of this program. So let me, let me just talk about our sponsors. Of course, our presenting sponsor, uh, Metropolitan State University. Thank you. Let's have a hand for, for Metro. Yeah. And, uh, and Pond America. Pond America is a, a, a fast-growing company. You've seen their ads, but you know they're very, very interested in multicultural marketing and, and recruitment. So we're gonna talk about them later. U.S. Bank, as I just mentioned, thank you. The St. Paul Hotel, uh, Minnesota Twins uh, have, have been with us for about 10 years now as a sponsor. And uh, you know they recently uh, became one of the first Major League Baseball teams to have a Merging Marcus department. So let's give them a lot of credit. I mean, this is a, yeah. A Mashali. The, the, the newspaper for the African community, what Tom Geet does here. He's gonna, we'll be meeting Tom later. Mashali. 
another good friend of ours, a, a, a new, uh, a new uh, organization, but we're going to hear a lot more about them, uh, Knowledge Networks, a, GF, a GFK company. They're here with us, Asterisk Group, uh, New American Dimensions, and Latino Midwest News. And on the other end, you know, we had some of the, we had some of the uh, departments here at Metro State uh, step up and sponsor this event today. The Office of the Vice President of Student Affairs, a College of Management, a Human Resources, a Center for Community-Based Learning, Undergraduate Admissions Office, the Student Life and Leadership Development, the Student Science Association, and the Alcohol and Drug Counseling Club. Let's have a hand for those departments. We've got some other things that you should pay attention to in your, in your uh, conference bags. Uh, uh, again, the CD-ROM, but more than that, you have the agenda. But we do have, and we'll be sharing a survey evaluation. I think we're going to hand that out separately, probably after 1 o'clock. And no one leaves without filling that, and the doors will be locked, and, you know, we're, we're taking names and, and numbers, so. We want that to happen. We're going to start the program now. I think we're on, because Saul, you know, Saul Gitlin, our first uh, speaker, he said, I want every minute to present. So that's, I love that energy. Saul Gitlin is not a, not a stranger here to Minnesota. And uh, I've, uh, our company's had an association with Kang and Lee. And one of the reasons why is they're the best organization for Asian and American marketing. They won so many awards, and it's such a pleasure to have this type of an organization with us, uh, who's a leader, really, in all the work that's been done with, uh, with the Asian American market. And uh, Saul Gillen is the Executive Vice President of Strategic Marketing Services, new business for Kang and Lee Advertising, the nation's leading multicultural marketing consultant and communication agency specialized in reaching Asian Americans. Mr. Gitlin has directed agency planning teams for AT&T, Bank of America, Sears, the New York Times, and Allstate Insurance. He directed the planning team for the Census 2000, a national quantitative qualitative study fielded simultaneously with nine ethnic groups in 10 languages. This project won the Advertising Research Federation's 2001 Grand Ogilvy Award, the highest honor for research in the Advertising Research Federation's planning. Prior to coming to Kang and Lee, Saul so worked for 10 years in senior marketing positions for multinational corporations in the People's Republic of China, Israel, and the United States. Saul so is completely fluent in Mandarin Chinese, Hebrew, and French, and holds a BA in Asian Studies from Cornell, an MA in East Asian Studies from Yale, and an MBA in Marketing from Columbia. So let's have a great Minnesota welcome for Saul so Gitlin. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here today and I'd like to begin by first thanking Metropolitan State University for the kind hospitality, but at the reception yesterday and now. I'm getting some feedback, right? Um, and to my old friend Rick Aguilar for inviting me for the umpteenth time, I guess maybe 10 years I've been coming out to Minnesota for this annual conference. Uh, so I'm delighted to be with you today. I've got a very aggressive agenda today. And um, thank you for putting me first. Very often in multicultural marketing in the United States, there's kind of a pecking order. Most clients will say, hmm, let's think about Hispanics because of the size of that audience. And then, hmm, let's think about African Americans because of the size of that audience. And Asian is kind of the third market considered. So I always appreciate when I get to be the first one to speak at a conference versus the last one. Um, what I'd like to uh, share with you today is to build a little bit on what Rick was talking about, the business case for multicultural marketing. As the first presenter, just to leave you with my own little soapbox comments about why multicultural marketing is important. Not because it's something you should do because it appears to be important, but rather it really is about a business case. And then I'll drill down very quickly into telling you more information about the Asian market, give you all the key facts and figures, which is also on the CD-ROM in your bag. And then from there, we'll spend more time um, in what I call uh, discussing what is cultural relevance in marketing. I think everybody, you know, if I say to you, well, how would you make culturally relevant Hispanic advertising or African-American advertising or Asian advertising? You know, certain things pop to mind, but is that really all it's about or is there much more? So with no further ado, 
Uh, and then, of course, there'll be discussion at the end. So let me speak a bit about the business case. And just for a minute to do this, let's forget what the subject of this conference is. And let's just role play a bit. Let's say that you are all the new marketing leadership for a brand new startup company um, that will be national in scope and that will be marketing a product or a service which is broadly relevant for adult Americans. So it's not a niche product. It's not something that only one group would buy and another group wouldn't. Think of something that you might buy in a supermarket or maybe something in the healthcare arena that would be broadly relevant for everybody. And as a new startup, you've got a budget assigned for your national marketing plan, but there's some debate as to how you should focus that budget in the first year. So like many companies do, you decide to spend money to hire consultants to come in and give you their thoughts, their ideas about how you should shape your marketing plan. And let's just for this role play say that I'm one such consultant and I've come in to pitch you on an idea about how you should focus your dollars for your first year national plan. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is that I represent a consumer group that I think it's worthy of your attention, which today represents a third of the United States population. And actually, in the next eight years, will become almost 40% of the US population. If we go out a little further in the next 25 years, this group will be half the US population. But let's come back to today. In the top 10 urban areas of the United States today, the consumers I want you to pay attention to are already the population majority. And if we look at the, the top 50 urban areas of the United States, these groups, uh, this group is the fastest growing population in those cities. So from an urban perspective, this is a major opportunity. Now, you're a national company, so I'd like to ask you a question. Is the state of California going to be an important state for you? Now, any of you that know marketing in the audience will realize that's a rhetorical question, because for any national marketer in the United States, California is not just an important state, it's arguably the most important state because it's the single most populous state in the United States. Well, the consumers I want you to pay attention to already starting 12 years ago were more than half the population of the state of California. They surpassed the 50% mark. Now, you might say, okay, so far I'm interested, but do these consumers have money to spend? Well, yes, in fact, annually, they have a purchasing power in excess of two trillion dollars. So if these consumers were put in one location and a national border were drawn around them, they would be one of the largest economies, certainly ranking as one of the top economies in the world. Another question for you. Have you heard of a group called the Baby Boomers? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you have heard of the Baby Boomers? Oh, good. Well, the consumers I want you to pay attention to outnumber the Baby Boomers by more than 25 million. And finally, um, when you think about how one uh, interacts with consumers, the marketing channels, the media channels, um, there's something called mainstream marketing and mainstream media, but interestingly, the consumers I want you to target can be reached through channels that fall outside the mainstream, and also, incidentally, the cost of using those channels is far below um, anything that you may have experienced in the general marketing arena. So with that as the background, Let's take a vote. How many of you think you should probably pay attention to this group? Right? But every, every head better go. How many of you, go ahead, how many of you say forget about it? Well, of course, just to be blunt, what idiot in his right mind could hear that as a setup and walk away from it? Let me make it even more tangible. Without these consumers that I'm arguing in favor of, your national marketing plan will look like that. Only when you embrace these consumers can you truly build a national marketing plan. Now, who am I talking about here? Hint, it's not just the Asians. I'm talking about the aggregation of three groups alone. The Hispanics, the African Americans, and the Asians. So we just heard some data in the opening remarks from the university. Uh, I said 34%, we heard 37%. True, there are other groups that fall under the designation of multicultural or people of color who I have not included in my calculation to you because I want to make a very dramatic point. Uh, we are no longer talking about minority here. We are no longer talking about marginal populations. We are no longer talking about consumers that should only be viewed as an option if you have extra money lying around. We are talking about business. 
And any marketer that would look at those numbers and turn his, back, his or her back on it is making an irresponsible business decision. Once again, we care about culture. We like to embrace culture and learn about culture and rejoice in the diversity of our country. But multicultural marketing is, predic marketing is predicated on business, selling, and moving product and earning money for the organizations involved. That is what we're talking about. And this is the way marketing to these groups needs to be categorized. Because when you put it that way, who possibly could walk out of the room and say, let's not do that? Nevertheless, eight out of 10 national marketers in the United States today are doing just that. Or if they're engaged, they're really dabbling. So with that said, let me turn, turn, turn a bit to the Asian market. I'm sorry, I'm challenging you by moving around the stage, but that's my, my style. So let me give you the basic facts and figures. We know from Census 2000, uh, 2010 rather, there were slightly in excess of 17 million Asians in the United States that represent over 5% of the US population. But that include, included more than 2 million multiracial Asians. And if you're working with census data, probably know that 2000 was the first census in US history where respondents to the census could uh, self-identify as being of more than one racial group. So President Obama in 1990 had to make a decision. Should he check off that he's white or check off that he's black? But in 2000, he could check off both. And indeed, starting in 2000, we're now seeing for the whole population this new group of people called multiracial. So there were 2.6 million multiracial Asians. If we net them out just to look at single race Asians, we had 14.7 million, slightly under 5% of the US population. Now, when I come to national marketers and say, hello, I'm Saul from Kang and Lee, and I'm here to speak to you about less than 5% of the US population, that very often is an invitation for the people listening to me to check their Blackberries, to, you know, to kind of tune me out a little bit. But of course, that is not the correct way to think about the Asian market, because this is a market that has extremely compelling characteristics that do not begin with the size of the population. First and foremost is it's a highly concentrated market. So yeah, it's 14 something million uh, single race Asians, but half of them live in three states alone, California, New York, and Texas. And when we look into those areas, we will find that uh, Asians are substantial portions of the local population. So for example, in California, they represent 13% of the state. That might be my entree point. I might come to a national marketer, pose my rhetorical question and say, excuse me, is California an important state for you? I know the answer to that question. And I say, well, I'm here to speak to about 13% of the state, which by the way, you'll learn in a minute, is the most educated, most affluent, most brand loyal part of the state that your current marketing is not reaching. Are you interested? And that's how we go. So first and foremost, highly concentrated. Second of all, this is a population of superlatives. First being fastest population growth rate of any racial group in the United States between 2000 and 2010. Um, a word to the wise, census does not classify Hispanics as, as a racial group, even though I gave you the reference there for Hispanics. They're not, uh, strictly speaking, classified as a race. They're an ethnic group. They're classified as an ethnic group in the census. But nevertheless, the Asian growth rate, if we look at the top line, including multiracial Asians, even outpaced the Hispanic growth rate, which is something new as compared to 2000. So first and foremost, fastest population growth rate. Highest median household income of any group in the United States, not just among populations of color, but almost $13,000 ahead of white people in the United States. And one of the reasons for that is enormously high rates of educational attainment. Also, um, yeah, and very entrepreneurial. Here you see data from the um, uh, Minority Business Survey in the US Economic Census in 2007. Asians owned and operated 1.6 million businesses nationally generating slightly over 500 billion in annual sales revenue. By contrast, in that same year, in the same study, there were more than two million Hispanic owned and operated businesses in the United States, which in aggregate generated slightly over 300 billion in annual sales revenue. So the Asian population is a small group of people, but their economic power is disproportionately large. If you were a business-to-business -business marketer, I'm very often asked this question, well, I'm a B2B marketer, who should I target in the multicultural segments? And I always say, well, it depends what you're selling. If you're selling chairs and office uh, furniture or, or you know, e equipment for retail outlets, go to the Latinos, there's many more businesses, 600,000 more businesses. If you're a financial company and your revenue is predicated on the volume of dollars flowing through the business, then your number one priority would be the Asian segment because of the sales revenue. 
Um, and when we see, when we look at higher uh, income breaks, whether it's 75 plus, 125K plus, or 200K plus, you'll find that Asians have the highest percentage of households in those breaks. So again, it's a small group of people, but extremely affluent, has a lot of money at its disposal. So if you look at this 8% of Asians earning 200,000 more than a year, that's approximately 357,000 households compared to the Latinos at 2%, which is about a quarter million households. So once again, if you're a luxury marketer and you uh, identify your target audience as households earning more than 200,000 a year, your number one priority would be the Asians because there's more households that fall into that segment. Um, annual buying power of $509 billion per year projected to go up by another $200 billion uh, in, in just a couple of years. So once again, although Asians are a third the size of the Latino population, they command well over 50% of uh, Hispanic purchasing power in the United States. Home ownership, second only to uh, white America, total population 65%, Asians 58%. The Asian market probably would have a higher rate of home ownership if it weren't for one thing. Most of them are recent immigrants, and it takes time for people to get into this country and actually put down roots by buying something. Um, the, uh, so, so, you know, by all these economic measures, this is a very attractive market for marketers. Now, many of you are probably saying, Asian, Asian, who are the Asians? Um, when we look in the census, we'll find more than 20 different groups from different national origins and, and ethnic backgrounds, but six of them alone account for 85% of the total population of the, of the total Asian population of the United States. And here you see them in their rank order by their national population size, the Chinese, the Indians, the Filipinos, the Vietnamese, the Koreans, and the Japanese. Now, of course, there are many other groups. When I make similar presentations in New York or California, you know, I, I always caution my audience, depending where you are in the country and where you want to market, you need to be sensitive to what the mix of Asians is in your area. So in California, indeed, Chinese lead the state for the Asian population, but if you're marketing in San Diego County, Filipinos outnumber Chinese four to one. If you're in the state of Texas, it's the Indians and the Vietnamese, which are the largest populations with Chinese only third. And of course, the example I always give on the, on, on the East and West Coast is I'll go to a blackboard and I'll write the word Hmong and I'll say, who can tell me who that is? Of course, here I am in, in in, in Minnesota, and of course everybody would know, it's very rare that people on the coasts will say anything, and whoever does comment is usually somebody from Minnesota or Wisconsin. <laughs> but as you know, here in this state, the Hmong dominate the Asian population. I'll show you a slide in a minute. And indeed, my company, for one of our clients, Allstate Insurance, we've created Hmong language collateral for use by Allstate agents here in the state of Minnesota. Um, so that's the uh, ethnic mix. And when we look at the population growth, we have that overall 43% growth, but the real growth story, one of the, 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 the most amazing growth stories in the last 10 years has been the growth of the Indian population, almost 70% growth. Um, when we look at these top six audiences, we find that with the exception of Japanese Americans, the overwhelming majority of individuals were born overseas and exhibit uh, correspondingly a, a, a preference for native language uh, communications and media consumption. The native language preference says absolutely nothing about how competent these people may or may not be in English. In fact, in many cases, they are extremely competent because of the education levels, because there are so many small business owners. You know, small business owners, even the ones operating within their own community, have to navigate a certain amount of English to be business owners, whether it's dealing with utilities and vendors, et cetera. Um, so there is an English competency in the market, but what this says is given an option, what language is in play at home, in the, in the home environment, and correspondingly, where would these consumers most naturally gravitate to for their news, information, and entertainment? Uh, an interesting statistic that came out 12 years ago is that Chinese is now the second most prevalent foreign language spoken in US households after Spanish. Up through 1990, both French and German uh, uh, followed Spanish on the list, and now in 2000, we see for the first time that an Asian language, Chinese, has popped up the list. Um, we spoke about them being concentrated, three states accounting for 50%. If we add tier two states, you'll get three quarters of the population. If we add tier three states, yay Minnesota in blue, uh, you'll get 90% of the population. And um, we, of course, I'm, I, don't, I don't mean to imply there are no Asians in the states that remain in yellow, but an Asian multicultural program will not succeed or fail based on its performance in the yellow states. You really need to play in the um, 
red, blue, uh, green, and blue states in order to have a successful program. When we look at some of these states, we see robust growth rates in traditional markets like New York and California. New Jersey, you see a 51% increase. Illinois, 40% increase. By the way, interesting factoid, there are now more Asians in the state of Illinois than in the state of Hawaii, uh, which is counterintuitive for many people, but that is the case. Uh, and you see Texas with a 72% increase. Some of the fastest growth areas you see here in the bottom, Nevada, Las Vegas is an important Asian city. North Dakota, yay, two families became four maybe, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, we're seeing the growth there. The other states, though, are important. Arizona is an important state. North Carolina is a tier three state along with Minnesota. So uh, those are where we're seeing some of the, um, the, the big growth areas. Hang on, maybe I should be pointing here. California, the largest state, I'm not going to take you through every data point here. You can look at this on your CD, but 13% of the state is Asian. There you see the mix of Asians in the state. So Chinese and Filipino are neck and neck in that state. It's hard to say. I mean, Chinese technically are the largest, but barely. Um, you see the growth rate, five of the 10 most spoken languages in the state, 169 billion in annual purchasing power. New York um, is the second most important state. Compared to California, the population of New York is much more concentrated in the greater New York City area versus California, where there's this huge distribution between the northern part of the state around the Bay Area and the southern part of the state around the Los Angeles DMA. Uh, but nevertheless, Asians are important. Here you see Chinese and Asian Indian are second. Filipinos are there, but only fourth on the list and some of the other groups on the list. And then, of course, Texas. You all knew Texas was a Latino state, but who knew that Texas was also an Asian state? It's one of the most important Asian states. And there you see it's Houston and Dallas, but Asian, Indian, Vietnamese, Chinese. Um, so there's been kind of different patterns that have brought uh, Asia, um, various groups to Texas. One of them is that the Vietnamese population, which uh, was uh, initially largely a refugee population, some of the initial settlement patterns were dictated by the US government and specifically the military that brought refugees in and tried to settle them in areas where uh, the military, the US military could look after the communities. So very often you find pockets of Vietnamese in parts of the country that have uh, army bases or, or military bases nearby. And then there are other reasons bringing Asians to the state of Texas. It's the university system there. The oil industry is bringing a lot of engineers and technicians and mathematicians in. So there are other reasons why uh, th that community has been growing there. And how could I come here without uh, telling you a little bit about Minnesota, even though I rarely pitch a client and say, let's start the conversation with Minnesota. But he, in this state, I might do it. So there you've got the state. Here's what your, your census figures look like, 2000 versus 2010. Uh, the Asians grew 54%, so yay, great Asian growth here. Exceeded the national growth rate for Asians. The real big stories are the Hispanics and the, and the blacks. In the state, uh, the total population only grew 8% and the white population grew two. So again, that early trend I spoke about in my role play at the beginning, I mean, make no mistake, um, uh, Minnesota is still overwhelmingly a white state, uh, but the trends are here, and, and this will just get deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and if we look at the mix of Asian in the states, here's the lineup. The Hmong clearly dominate followed by some of the other groups. And, and the Hmong community here, you know, it's a very interesting community. The, the original bastion of the Hmong community was in uh, California, the Fresno, California area, that part of California. There's been a lot of remigration, new people coming in. So it's great that this part of the country has aggregated a population that, um, you know, can claim to be the largest in, 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 in this state. It brings some attention of marketers to this community that might not uh, otherwise uh, be brought into focus if it weren't for this, this uh, critical mass in Minnesota. So um, that's just some of the basic facts and figures. We're talking about a population which is, you know, a third the size of the Latino population. Uh, and unfortunately, many marketers say, well, too small. I can't deal with it. But you, it, you kind of want to recommend it a little bit because it has such beautiful characteristics. It's educated, it's affluent, um, it owns homes, um, and it's got a lot of money to play with. So marketers should care about that, and indeed many marketers do, and I'll be showing you a lot of examples of this. But now I'd like to switch gears, and I want to talk about this issue of cultural relevance. And to begin this, I'd like to show you a 60-second English language television commercial um, that was ran a bunch of years ago, but the age of the commercial is irrelevant to why I'm showing it to you. And um, I'd just like to show it to you and then um, get some 
uh, make some comments about it. You remember that commercial? Raise your hand, please. Yeah, a bunch of you do. That commercial ran more than 10 years ago, and as I said, the age of the commercial is irrelevant. Of course, she's carrying a cell phone that you, yeah. right? Um, but this was the centerpiece of a campaign that at that time, AT&T launched to reposition the company under the brand theme, it's all within your reach. And a lot going on for AT&T then, dramatic growth of wireless, dramatic growth of email usage, which was threatening the company's you know, traditional product, proliferation of competitors, not only other phone companies, but some smaller, uh, not only big phone companies, but some smaller niche tier two, tier three providers, as well as the extension of telecommunications offerings uh, from uh, satellite companies, cable companies, et cetera. And at the time, all these new competitors were saying, at and the dinosaur. Yeah, they invented all this stuff 100 years ago, but they're the dinosaur. They're big unwieldy. They've got too many products. They can't focus on consumers. And this was at and attempt to say, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, we've got this history of innovation. We are big. We have all these products, but that's why we can empower consumers. What does it's all within your reach mean? It means empowerment. I can empower you. It's all within your reach. Interestingly, just last month, at and launched a brand new campaign. It's a new company now out of Texas uh, with new agency, et cetera, uh, under the theme, it's what you do with what we do. That's the new thing. And it was touted in the media as you know, this big dramatic breakthrough about empowerment. And I actually commented in the media and said, this is just a, research, you know, a, re a, a, a resurrection, if you will, of this strategy, which I think is a brilliant strategy. Because what do we want these products to do for us? We want them to empower us, right? So in any case, at and launched this, and um, in short, this was not an example of good advertising. This was an example of great advertising at the time. It blew away all their um, expectations through pre and post tracking of what it was doing to consumers' mindset about the brand. It won every creative award the year it came out. It was named one of the best spots of the decade by Adweek magazine. Uh, it was uh, resurrected after the census 2000, a few years after 2000, published a report documenting the statistical demise of the traditional family in the United States, that being a married husband and wife with children under the age of 18 at home. There was a lot of discussion in the media about how that demographic reality was being reflected in popular culture. And again, there were journalists that said, oh, you remember that spa from at and the working mom, et cetera, et cetera. So, Again, not good advertising, great advertising. When they launched this, they came to us. We'd been working with them for a decade and said, uh, we want you to interpret this strategy, it's all within your reach, for four Asian groups that were important at and customer groups, Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese, and Japanese. And to at and credit, they never said to us, please just translate this. Uh, they said, you know, come up with your own ideas or your own stories around the strategy. So we did, and then we're funded to go to focus groups in New York and California with those four different audiences. But I, leading the research, I said, you know, I know how clients react, I know how clients think. If they get something that's not only good but great, award-winning, there's this tendency to say, oh, we want to do it in Spanish, just translate it into Spanish, or just put this in that market. So just to anticipate the possibility that I might have to defend why we should do something special, I decided to begin the focus groups by showing that spot to my immigrant consumers. Okay, we, 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 and, and we had screened for immigrants because who calls most heavily to Asia? Who generates those permanent revenues for at and It was the immigrants. So we started the groups by showing that spot before we showed any of the work that we created. And in focus groups, we always begin with high-level questioning. You know, how many of you like it? How many of you are neutral? And how many of you don't like it? How many of you think that they liked it? Okay. How many of you think they were totally neutral, neither like nor dislike? A few hands. How many of you don't think that they like it? So this is very interesting. Four different ethnic groups, different focus groups, different, two different coasts. They all hated that spot. They hated that spot, and three reasons came up. If I had time, I would lead you through. Let's see if somebody can tell me the number one reason that people were uncomfortable with this spot. Yeah? They couldn't identify with it. Uh, yeah, but something more specific. I'm going to, yes? Um, about OK, you're de I, I, I want somebody just to say it more directly. They couldn't identify with it. Yeah, but something more specific. I'm going to, yes? Okay, you're de I, I, I want somebody just to say it more directly. So like independence of the woman or empowerment of the woman. Okay, let's take one more up there. No, 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 no. I mean, when, when we showed the spot, we were, we're going for the story, not that. One more comment, that's it. No man. That's it. That was the very first comment we heard in every group. Where is the father in the family? 
Okay? You don't know. Think about what you just saw. You don't know. Maybe the father left for work early that morning because he had a meeting on Wall Street or something or you know, at his brokerage firm or whatever. Or now much more ominously, are you showing me a divorced or abandoned woman? And now the consumers begin by feeling profoundly uncomfortable about this woman's situation. Then there were two other things we heard in every group. I'm going to give them to you because I really can't use up the time. I, I, I like to keep it interactive, but I've got limited time here today. The second thing we heard is this is not a good mother. And the reason she's not a good mother may not be why you think she's not a good She's not a good mother not because the house is chaotic or the way the kids are dressed. or She's not a good mother because she should never put herself in the position of having to choose between her children and her work. The implication being that her children are most important. But now, if this poor, abandoned, or divorced woman is forced to exit the home to earn money to support her kids, at the very least, she must bring some quality childcare into the home. You remember in the, in the spot I just showed you, the little girl, it's a little bit of comic relief. She says, our babysitter lets us watch TV all day. Uh-uh, my consumer said, oh, for goodness sake, if this woman is abandoned or divorced and she's forced to go out and work and leave her kids, at the very least, she's got to bring somebody into the home that will help them with their homework, read them books, teach them music, stimulate them in some way, not somebody who will let them watch TV all day. And then in every group, we heard a third comment. It's a little bit outlandish. It's not indicative of necessarily a huge theme running through the Asian community. Very chauvinist comment we heard from men. Anybody want to take one stab at this? No? Hmm, only three daughters and no sons. What a shame. Maybe that's why dad's not there anymore. Yeah, and I'm not saying that to, uh, in any way to stereotype Asian men, but we heard it in groups, this, rem this remarking on the fact that there were three daughters in the family and no sons in the family as kind of being not an ideal situation. And I'm starting here, before I get into other great examples to show you, with a key thought that I want to leave you today. A year or two from now, you'll forget all the details of my presentation. Remember this. Multicultural, I could have taken that spot, translated it into Chinese, literally translate the script into Chinese, recast the actors. I would have found a Chinese mom and three Chinese girls. I would have put them in a house. I would have put some good props in the house to make it feel like a Chinese house. But still, mom, the same story. Maybe I would have messed with the music to get a little more relevant music. Would it have worked? No. Because the situation and the look and the feel of it is not right for the community. That's the power of multicultural marketing. Every time any of you say, oh, let's just stick a face in there. Let's make the white face black face. Let's make, the, the, you know, let's make it look like a Mexican face or an Asian face. Enormous red flags, banners, dragons, and lanterns should start going off in your head saying, wait a minute, this might work, but it could be a disaster for me. That's what multicultural marketing is really about. It's thinking beyond the obvious. So of course, let's admit that language is important. I can't communicate with most Chinese if I'm not communicating in Chinese. And it's true that consumers would like to see themselves. It, it doesn't mean, you know, I'm a white guy from New York. It doesn't mean that I can't connect in an ad with an African-American spokesperson. But obviously, if you put somebody in there that looks exactly like me, it might give me a little extra, it might cause me to consider it a little more. And in the case of these populations, which often are marginalized in other sections of our society, when you communicate with them that way, it's like sending a hand engraved invitation. It's the difference between putting a mimeograph thing on the wall that says, please come to the Christmas party, and now sending something in Chinese to the three Chinese people on staff and that, that you know, they cannot mistake is an invitation for them personally to come to the party. So these things are important, but cultural relevance is much more than that. And when we look at the marketing cycle, you know, it, it, it's a very simple cycle. The management students in the room and professors, you begin with some, some type of market assessment and research and you eventually, you know, decide to do something. You plan a program and develop it and execute it. Hopefully, which way I have to press over here. Hopefully you're going to track it and measure it. And by the way, I will be the first to say when a client comes to me and says, I want to spend half a million dollars with you. And I, I probe them. I say, how are we going to track it? Let's talk about how we're going to track it. And they can't work that out. I often say to them, you know, save your money. Don't, if we can't track this, let, then it'll be a one-time thing and you'll never do it again. So that's very important. And this becomes an iterative process, but really cultural relevance has to permeate all aspects. 
of this part. It's not just about the face in the print ad and the language on the TV spot. So let's talk a little bit about these things. Market assessment and research. You know, every business has to start by analyzing its customer data. When I sit down with a new client, when I'm pitching a client, and they say, well, where do we begin? I say, well, how many customers do you have? And you know, I'm pitching national clients. Oh, we have 10 million customers, 20 million customers. I'll say, well, what percentage of them are Asian? And they'll be like, we don't know. Well, before you do anything to find new customers, let's figure out who you already have. And the good news is, there are great mathematical segmentation, uh, mathematically and culturally driven segmentation algorithms that can help us identify who is sitting in a file. So I can take a, a customer file of 25 million records, and within 48 hours, we can slice it and dice it by 177 different ethnicities to say, OK, without doing anything, you have this national database that looks like this. And lo and behold, I just did this last week for a client. Wow, you already have 40,000 Chinese customers. And now, before we talk about how we're going to market to Chinese, let's look at those Chinese customers. How did you get them? Where are they from? What did they buy? Do they look like all your other customers? Are they buying more? Are they buying less? Are they more loyal? And this starts to help inform what we might do going forward and where the sweet spot and the opportunities will be. Uh, of course, we do get to a point where we need to do research. We always look first for third-party existing research, whether it's public studies that either for free or that we can purchase, you know, omnibus studies, syndicated research. In the absence of targeted Asian research in the United States, we very often will fall back on looking at recent research in Asia. Because if I can establish demographically, which I can, let's say I'm targeting the Chinese or the Vietnamese community, that a high percentage are recent immigrants, and I don't have any data, because let's say I'm pitching Coca-Cola, and I don't have data about you know, Chinese Americans drinking Coca-Cola, but I have a study just published last month about cola consumption in the Chinese regions of Asia. I can make, it's not a perfect, I can't apply it perfectly, because this, the environments and the competitive landscape's different, but I can draw some uh, um, uh, insights from that. Uh, but whenever we look at any research that is available, and this is particularly a problem with Asian research, the first thing we have to do is say, well, what's the methodology behind the research? I can't tell you how often somebody will come to me and say, we have Asian data. Oh, great, you have Asian data. Um, which ethnic groups are underlying that data? Chinese, you know, Indian, Filipino? Oh, we don't know that. It's just Asian. That's a limitation for me. Second question, what language was your survey in? English. It's also an issue for me, because a lot of consumers in my market would not complete an English language survey. So that's something we always have to consider. Of course, when, uh, when more research is warranted, there are great uh, organizations and uh, providers in this country, we're going to hear from some later today, that are specialists in fielding multicultural research. There are special things that have to be uh, considered when fielding quantitative research. And certainly in the qualitative arena, you need capable moderators that can work in all these languages. Native speaker does not equal moderator. Moderation is a skill in focus groups. So there are great providers. Uh, and then when we conduct proprietary research, we have to um, always ensure that our methodology is sound. And for us in the Asian community, the gold standard is to field research in what we call the language of comfort, meaning if I want to research Chinese Americans, once I screen to make sure that my respondent, whether it's on the phone or in a focus group, is Chinese, I would then ask the next question, what language would you like to answer my survey in? And I give choice, English or one of the two main dialects spoken by Chinese in the United States, Mandarin or Cantonese. And only by giving that choice will I get truly a potential sample that will be representative of the entire market. And it's amazing that every time we do this in markets like New York and California, and, and, and we're working with statistically significant cell sizes, the language choice in our surveys just really mirrors what we know demographically about the local market. The other thing we need to be concerned about in market assessment uh, to, to make it culturally relevant is we have to really keep in our minds that brand maturity, which I'll define in a minute, is crucial when understanding these populations. And this is a very simple concept. This concept says, hey, how many of you know these brands, right? Raise, how many of you recognize those brands out there? Of course, right? who would not? And you recognize them even if you don't use them. I haven't eaten Oscar, Oscar Mayer lunch meats in, you know, I don't know how many years, but I know that brand, I know what it is. But why should somebody who's recently arrived from China or Korea or Vietnam have the same feeling, knowledge, or the same feeling for those brands as somebody born and raised here. Or to look at this in a different way, if brand maturity is the nexus of awareness 
and then knowledge and consideration or purchase consideration, your brand may be up here for the US born and raised population, but you may be way down there for a recent immigrant population. You're all shaking your heads because this is intuitive, but I can't emphasize enough how many big brands just forget this. They, many, many marketers believe there's some linear, you know, like you arrive in this country and six months later you graduate to knowing everything that somebody was born and raised. It doesn't work that way. And I always say, imagine if I put you tomorrow in Shanghai and you encounter, you go to the store and there's a brand that's been famous in China for 150 years, how would you know it? You wouldn't know it. And even if you, you, you start to hear about it, you wouldn't have the same feeling for it that somebody who was born and raised in that country, right? This is intuitive, but it has to be stated. Um, so let me give you an example of brand maturity or, or how one addresses it. We started working with Ford in Canada in 2006 at a time that their tagline was, uh, their, their, their strategy was built for life in Canada. Built for life in Canada, it's a really kind of great rallying cry. Ford has been in Canada since two years after it was established in the United States. In Canada, Ford is considered to be a domestic car company, not American, but a domestic in Canada. So Built for Life in Canada, they sell lots of trucks in Canada, known in Canada. And we take this to, we were looking at the Chinese immigrant community, and we take that line to the Chinese immigrants, and they look at it and they say, Built for Life in Canada, there's something there, but I'm just a little confused. Oh, really, why are you confused? Well. I like the part about life in Canada, but when you say it's built for life in Canada, I'm not really sure what that means because I just got here. I'm still trying to make my way and understand what life in Canada is. So I don't have this focused idea about what built for life in Canada. So on that basis, we said we've got a little, now they all know the brand, it's a global brand, but the Chinese uh, worldwide and, and, and including in Canada are not the heaviest purchasers of Ford. So they know the brand, but they don't have a lot of experience with it and a little bit confused by this line. So we said to them, we want to help this brand maturity. We want to make the brand a little more accessible. So we came up with a new line for the Chinese in Canada. I don't know if there are any Chinese, are there any Chinese speakers in the room? Yeah, there you go. So there's one line, which means get closer to life in Canada. We said to them, you know, it's controversial when you say to a client, I'm going to mess with your brand. Most clients are like, you can't mess with my brand. We said, but the good news is we're going to keep life, your brand is all about life in Canada. We're going to keep that. We just got to tweak this a little bit to make it more accessible. And we took what was a declarative statement built for life in Canada that implies that the viewer understands what it is and we turned it into an aspirational statement. Get closer to life in Canada, because what immigrant from any country in Canada doesn't, at some level, aspire to get closer to his or her new life in Canada? Now, when we get into program planning and development, um, you know, the, our toolbox is the same as any other marketing toolbox. So the management students in the room, if you're learning Marketing 101, this is Marketing 101. And we have to conduct a situation analysis, and we identify challenges. Maybe we do a SWOT analysis, competitive landscape. The only difference here is that the output of all this analysis for a given brand may point us in a direction that's different from what that given brand is doing overall in the general market. So one of the good examples here would be life insurance. You know, insurance companies very often, and I, I, I can't spend too much time talking about this, but for first-time purchasers of life insurance, the typical mainstream product that's sold uh, to first-time buyers of life insurance would be what's called term life, which is you're basically renting protection. But the Asian community, even young first-time buyers of life insurance in the Asian community, are more receptive to purchasing more expensive life insurance called whole life or universal life, because there's an investment component to it that, that will end up with some residual value to the policy. So even though those policies are typically tr trade-up policies for other consumers later in their, in their, in their um, lifetimes, the Asian community is very receptive to start buying those types of policies early, even though they cost more upfront. So you might have an insurance company that in the mainstream is focusing on life insurance acquisition for term life, but in an Asian multicultural program, we might be pushing whole life or universal life. And then, of course, um, we will execute the marketing program and, and the, uh, certainly the communications through the prism of cultural relevance. When we do that, everything has to be placed in the right channels. You don't create Chinese advertising and then run it in the trib, right? You'd have to go into a Chinese newspaper. Or you don't create a, a Korean language TV commercial and put it on CNN. You might do it for shock value once or twice, but 
but you, know, you have to use the right media. And the good news is there's a very rich environment of media. You've got your own Asian media here in the Twin Cities, whether it's Hmong or media reaching some of the other groups. Trust me that when you hit the coasts, California, New York, or even Texas, there's huge numbers of Asian media across all channels, print, broadcast, et cetera. So you have to be in the right channels. And then, of course, we have to worry about the expression. Are we really going to take the same strategy and same execution? Should I just translate that AT&T spot? Well, most marketers, marketers don't come to me to do this. This is just a translation company exercise. Most marketers play in here. They say, keep my strategy because you can't mess with my brand strategy, but express it differently. Give me a different execution. And some, I think, particularly bold marketers will uh, say, you know what? I don't care what my mainstream strategy is. If you can come up with a new strategy that will sell more of my product to this community, let's do it. Uh, and and uh, you know, this is what I would call really bold. Um, then because of the uh, heterogeneous nature of the Asian community with respect to ethnic groups and languages and cultures, we have to know before we build advertising, are we going to target just one group uh, or target multiple groups? And even if we target multiple groups, are we going to create unique communications for every single group? Or are we going to try and find some thread that will allow us to achieve production efficiency while simultaneously targeting multiple groups? I'm going to show you examples of all this in a minute. Of course, everything's driven by an insight. So, with um, a little over half hour to go, where's Rick? Is Rick here? I've got, I've got till 10.15, right? Are we, we're good, okay. Yeah, no, no, so we, we're making good time. Let's come back to Ford. This is targeting Chinese in Canada, uh, 2006. This is group specific. We're only targeting the Chinese population. So the situation for Ford, universal awareness of the brand. Ford is in China as well. But historically, Chinese in China, in Canada, in the United States, all over actually, are not the, have not been the heaviest purchasers of Ford. What cars do Chinese people buy? They buy Asian cars. They buy Toyota, Honda, Hyundai increasingly, Nissan, Subaru, these kind of cars. And at the other end, they buy lots of high-end vehicles. BMW, Mercedes, Lexus, Acura. You can see this. This was a case where sometimes you have to be very creative in doing research. This was a case where we didn't have full research on the, um, the, the vehicle usage behavior of Chinese in Canada, nor do we have funding to do new quantitative surveys to really benchmark it. So what do we do? We go park ourselves in the Pacific Mall in suburban Toronto on a Saturday. This is a Chinese mall where literally 99.9% .9 of the people that come to this mall to eat and shop are Chinese. And we just sit in the parking lot for four hours on a Saturday, sunny Saturday when the mall is at its peak, and we start looking at what comes in to the parking lot. And you can literally go aisle to aisle. I mean, it's, it's labor intensive, but when you have, don't have research budget, you know, as a researcher, I never say to my client, we can't get an insight. There's always a way to get an insight. And this is kind of quick and dirty, but you want to know something? It's valid. You know that everybody coming to this mall, you know, this is a mall that holds thousands and thousands of vehicles, and you can literally go up and down at, at peak time in the mall and count the vehicles and, you know, what brands are there, et cetera. So, Universal awareness of Ford, low usage, but the good news is because of low usage, no negative baggage. There's nobody in this community that's saying, oh, my uncle had a Ford or my dad had a Ford and it used to break down those American cars. Nobody has that attitude. So very neutral. So our goal was just to grab attention because they're not thinking about it. How do we grab attention? And then to nudge the consideration into the maybe category so that it would be top of mind. Now at the time, Ford was also you know, had these kind of grab attention and drive consideration strategies in the mainstream in Canada. And the way they were doing it was by using a very beloved spokesperson in Canada in the person of Wayne Gretzky, the international hockey superstar, who's Canadian. They were also using the voice of the Canadian actor Kiefer Sutherland, who was Jack Bauer on the hit show 24, uh, who's Canadian, in case you didn't know. We, they were using his voice for all voiceovers in TV and on radio. And so we started to say, is there a way that we could find somebody that would have that attention-grabbing you know, capability for us in the immigrant Chinese community? The, the, re are the sweet spot for Ford were the most recent immigrants to Canada because people arriving need to get settled. And one of the ways they need to get settled is to buy a vehicle. And those consumers are overwhelmingly from the People's Republic of China. So although there are Chinese who live in Canada from Taiwan and Hong Kong and other areas, the, more than 95% of all the recent immigrants, Chinese immigrants to Canada in the last 15 years, 
are coming from mainland China. So that was the target consumer in mind. So we said, could we find somebody with that attention-grabbing power? And we did, and here he is. Are there any Canadians in the room? Anybody from Canada here? Well, I promise you, even if there were Canadians in the room, probably no hands would have gone up. Meet Mark Rosewell, a 46-year-old white Canadian from Ottawa, who, like me, in the 1980s, went to China to study Chinese. And his, his language ability was really good. He was very talented with a good pronunciation. And one day, Central Television in China came to Beijing University, where he was studying, and said, you know what? We have a show this weekend, and we need a foreigner who can speak Chinese to come on the show and speak 10 lines of Chinese. Do you have any students that have good pronunciation? And the school said, oh, sure, go speak to him. And so they went to speak to him, and he thought, that's a fun thing to do. I'm on a foreign student in this country. I'll go on television. It's just kind of a lark. So he did it, and he went on this show and spoke 10 lines. What he did not know at the time was that that show was being broadcast live to 750 million people in China. And the next morning, he woke up as a national celebrity which has not abated since. He was then taken under the wing of one of the most famous stand-up comedians in China who practices a, a, a traditional form of Chinese stand-up comedy, who trained him as the first foreigner ever to master this craft. He went on to a very successful career doing that. He's then become the host of many television programs. And to this day, he is a national media celebrity in China. He goes by the stage name Da Shan. Da Shan which means big mountain. There's a whole story why. I can't get into that now. Um, and so, and he's beloved by Chinese, and all Chinese know that he's Canadian. So we thought, what better way to bridge a Canadian company to the immigrant Chinese community from mainland China than to take this guy who they all know is Canadian and they love and use him as the attention grabber. So we use him to promote a portfolio of Ford vehicles, sometimes for unique vehicles. Let me show you one example of a spot we did for the Ford Focus. Uh, the brief for this spot was we wanted to, um, hang on, I have to get back here. Um, Ford Focus, it's a, a compact sedan. Um, again, neutral impression, kind of nothing to, to, to think about really on the part of the consumer. So the brief here was use him to grab the attention and then position the vehicle as if there's kind of interesting features and, and options on this vehicle that really make it kind of exciting, you know, unexpectedly exciting. That was the brief here. I want to emphasize there's no, by using him, we had to be very sensitive to, even though he's beloved, he's this white guy from Canada. We don't presume to say to Chinese people, because he drives a Ford, you should drive a Ford, which is why every time we use him, you will see Chinese people driving the car. We're using him in a different way. We're using him because they like this guy. When he comes on the screen, they will sit. They won't run to the kitchen to get a drink because they like to hear this guy talking, and that keeps them glued to the information. But we are not presuming, I mean, we always show actual target consumers, the types of people we think should you know, be considering this car, in the spot. So we're using him in, in, in a very specific way. Um, now moving along, uh, rather than go back to my PowerPoint, because then I want to show you two more commercials, sometimes we have a client and we need to target different ethnic groups, and they choose to do group-specific work, which means that um, you know, they're going to create one set of communications for one group and another set for another work. So I want to show you a campaign we did for Vonage. This is for the United States, for Vonage World, which is their international calling product. Maybe some of you in the room use Vonage. It's a great service at home. And this was looking at the, South, the Indian community, the South Asian community, and the Chinese community. Now, both communities saw the offer, this great price point to get unlimited calling to 60 countries, including India and then China, um, as, as a great volume, like really getting a great deal. In the case of the Chinese, they saw it as like winning a deal, winning a great hand by getting this product. Um, but um, we chose to communicate differently with the market to make sure that we sent that hand-engraved invitation. So in the case of the Indians, we said to ourselves, you know, strategically, the experience of calling back home to Asia is one in which native language is at the center of the um, consumption experience, right? Because when Chinese people call China, when Indian people call India, even though they may speak uh, English here, when Chinese people call China, you're probably speaking Chinese on the phone. And when Indian people call home, they can speak English, but when they're calling their moms or dad, it's usually another language. 
Statistically, there are about nine languages that are the most heavily spoken by Indians in the United States. And we felt that we wanted to somehow embrace that linguistic diversity in an ad for Vonage, which after all is about talking, right? But there's no way anybody can create eight or nine different ads. So we decided to use language as a graphic treatment in the advertising. I'm gonna show it to you in broadcast and then in print, where we had bubbles of conversations coming out in our ads each one in a different language that statistically is tied to the Indian population. So anybody watching this ad who spoke one of those languages could see his or her culture and language reflected in the ad, but at the same time, most of the ad is in English. In the case of the Chinese, we took a whole different approach to convey this notion of getting a good deal or winning the, the uh, great hand. Let, have a look at what we did. Oops. And then the Chinese spot. So do that in, um, we also had companion print in this campaign. So you see in the, in the Indian one, if you're catching this in the newspaper, most of the Indian media, by the way, the targeted media in this country, 90% of it is actually English language media because they want to be able to reach the broad base of Indians. Now Indians speak all these different languages, but they share English as the colonial language. And here you see in the headline some phrases coming from Hindi, which is the national language of India, which is appropriate. But what's going on here is that if you, there's Telugu, there's Malayalam, there's Kannada, there's uh, Punjabi, there's Gujarati up there. If you come from one of those groups, you will find yourself in that ad. So there's that, that, that hand engraved invitation to you. And, because that, and, and these are all conversations such as people would have on the phone, like, hey, mom, can I have that recipe? How's grandpa? You know, the kinds of things that you would say when calling back up. In the case of Chinese, for those of you that didn't recognize it, this is the game of mahjong. It's a Chinese game, a beloved Chinese game, sometimes used uh, as a gambling game, where people have to get the right combinations of tiles. Some of the tiles in the actual game have Chinese characters on them, so we took creative license and we made whole phrases about this Vonage product using the tiles and making sure, saying that with Vonage you get the best combination of benefits and price the same way you would win a hand in this game. Um, you know, sometimes though we don't have the luxury of targeting multiple groups and doing it in different ways because obviously, you know, what I just did for Vonage, we had one production for one set of advertising and another for the other. When we worked for the census in 2000, we had to target 10 different Asian ethnic groups in the United States. And here we needed to template it to be efficient while still showing customization. Yay, Hmong advertising. We did Hmong for Census 2000. That was for this state and Wisconsin. Your senators demanded it, and we, uh, and we did. Um, this was for a phase of the advertising. We did research with all these groups that showed us that while people understood the utility of the census, you know, the country being counted so the federal government would know how to distribute $180 billion in federal funding, you know, where schools had to be built, roads had to be built, hospitals, et cetera. There was this feeling in the population said, we understand that that's important, but you know, I'm just one person. If I don't do it, it's not gonna make a difference. And in this phase of the campaign, we're saying, oh no, that's not true. You, the individuals, you know, spotlight on your head are gonna make a difference. And if every person like you felt the same way, your community won't be counted. So we used actual, this is the US government spending taxpayers' money. The US government, unlike a lot of commercial marketers, demanded that the women we used in each of these ads had to be from those ethnic groups. So we had to, we had to source talent. Each of those women are actually from the groups uh, they were represented. When we got to broadcast, though, we had to be smart. We couldn't c create 10 separate um, television commercials. It was just not economically feasible. So what we did is we created a hybrid, templated, customized campaign where a lot of shared elements were in play, but we added some customization. Let me just show you an example of that. And this is for the naysayers who say that Asian marketing can't be done profitably because there's so many different groups. There are lots of ways to to, um, to plan um, communication so that they still can be cost efficient. Let me just show you uh, two examples. I'm gonna show you an Indian TV commercial and right after it, I'm gonna show you the same commercial targeted, oh, sorry, to the Chinese community. And you'll see, look for the things that are different, look for the things that are the same in the two commercials. So you probably saw there, 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 There was a lot of shared imagery, the school bus, the hospital scene, et cetera. And in between that, we cut images of Chinese people walking in, in the Indian version and Indian version. So yeah, it was two separate spots, but when you do all the cost calculations at the back end of what it costs to produce that advertising, you didn't have to create 
10 separate commercials. There was a lot of backroom editing that allowed you to target this wide breadth of groups and still keep your budget down. Sometimes, though, it gets even worse than that. Sometimes a client says, look, I want to target multiple groups, but I only have this little bit of money, okay? Um, and that was the case for the California State Lottery, who we handled for five years. And this was to market the Super Lotto, which maybe you have it here in Minnesota, Wednesday and Saturday, pick six numbers, you could win $100 million, that kind of thing. I'm sure every state pretty much has. It's like the Mega Millions as well. Um, it's the big lottery in the state of California. Uh, we had research that showed universal past 12-month purchase of lotto, super lotto tickets by Chinese, Koreans, and Vietnamese in the States. Asians are big gaming enthusiasts. They like to play casino games. They like to gamble at mahjong. They like to play lottery. Uh, there's a very strong sense of luck in many of these cultures. So, you know, the idea of spending a dollar and maybe having, getting lucky is, is very appealing. Um, what was interesting in the research is the, the lottery conducted research with the mainstream Hispanics, African Americans, and Asians, where the Asians diverged from everybody else was thus. All the groups said that the uh, driver in purchasing a ticket was the fantasy of the big win, like you know, winning 100 million or 200 million dollars. Uh, where the Asians diverged, though, is that whereas the white people, the Hispanics, and the African Americans said, oh, you know, if I win 100 million, that's it, I'm not going back to work. You know, just call all my friends, say, I'm retired, throw a party, buy real estate, go traveling, help my family. The Asians said all of that, plus, now I can really start investing. <laughs> As if 100 million or 150 million would now be the springboard, right? <laughs> to go. So we had to create a campaign for the lottery targeting three audiences, Chinese, Koreans, and Vietnamese. We had to, we really had money to barely cover one of those markets. So we came up with a, a strategy, and I'm showing this to you again so that you walk away knowing you can target these multiple groups in an efficient way if you have a smart agency behind you. Um, you'll, you'll notice how we did it. We told a story visually, not in words, so already we don't have to have people talking languages on the screen, okay? By telling the story visually, we could de-emphasize the talent. So we didn't have to put Chinese people camera front, you know, which might alienate other groups, you know? We, very often, if you want the identification, you'll show Chinese people, Korean, Vietnamese people. We showed Asian people, but kind of downplayed them so that they were accessible to all. Everybody could look at it and say, that could be me, that could be my community. We told the story in pictures. We did use words, but only in words on the screen, which obviously varied, but that's a very easy editing job to do. Um, so we told the story very, very simply. I'm going to show you two examples. There, it, there were three spots in the whole campaign. I'm going to show you two of the spots targeting the Chinese community. And then right after the second spot, I'm going to show you the first spot again targeting the Korean community. And you tell me afterwards whether anything in the Korean spot was different from what you had already seen in the Chinese spot. Was anything different? Just call it out. Was anything different there? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, say that again. I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't hear what, what's being said. No, no. Right. I'll, I'll tell you because I, I, I want to finish up and I, I have two more spots I need to show you. Uh, the only thing different was when he checked his ticket in the newspaper. The first time I showed it to you, there was a Chinese newspaper there. And the second time I showed it to you, it was a Korean newspaper. That's the only difference. Everything else in those spots was identical. And we just edited the language at the end, and we got it almost like a two for one. Not, a, not exactly a two for one, but almost like a two for one. We're in the very home stretch here. I just want to say, I spoke earlier about the fact that sometimes you'll have a particularly bold client who'll say, you know what, forget my general brand strategy. This, marketing is all about selling, and if you can figure out a way to sell more, I'll do it. Clients like to sit around the room and put all their communication on the wall and feel like it all hangs together. And I, like to play devil's advocate and say, that's for you, but it's not for the market, right? Because if Chinese people are only looking at Chinese newspapers, you know, they're not going to see this around town. Clients will very often say, well, what if the Chinese consumer sees the ad that I do for them, and then they're driving down the highway in Los Angeles, and they see something else for the general market? Won't that confuse them? I say, it won't confuse them. It'll impress them, because then they will know for sure that you did something special for them, OK? This is glass half full, glass half empty. But this was the case in 2003 with Bank of America. We've been working for them for nine years. They came to us and they said, if you can figure out how to open more checking accounts for us in this community, you can do whatever. 
And we knew from research over many years what the, what the main barrier was to getting more Asian immigrants to open accounts. And the barrier could, it could be stated thus. There was huge admiration for Bank of America. Bank of America. I'm an immigrant in America. Huge aspirational value of the, of the brand. And what people would feel like if I could open an account and do my business with Bank of America, I'll feel really entrenched here like I'm really here. So very positive in that sense. But consumers were not going there. Why? Because it was precisely that big Americanness that kept them distant. They felt like, will the bank really understand me? Will they be able to speak to me? Do they understand what's important in my culture? And because of that, a lot of these consumers were saying, I aspire to do business there, but I'm not ready. That's why I'm going to ethnic banks, Chinese banks, Korean banks, etc. So we knew that if we could bridge that gap, if we could get consumers to say, no, actually Bank of America is perfect for me, then we could get more accounts open. And my hypothesis leading the strategy there was that because this was a bank founded in 1904, in San Francisco that somewhere in the history of the bank would be stories about how they had supported maybe the Chinese community or some of the other Asian communities in the state. And that if I told a lot of these stories, it would convince people that they cared about them. So I went to the archives of the bank to look for those anecdotes, but what I found was something much more profound. I found the story of how Bank of America was established. It was established in 1904 by a hotshot 20-something finance guy who was born and raised in San Francisco, but the son of Italian immigrants on the north side of San Francisco. But the kind of guy who today would be like a hotshot in a hedge fund in, in, on Wall Street. And at the turn of last century, and he was on the board of a major bank in San Francisco, and at the turn of last century, banks didn't exist for the mass of Americans. They existed for wealthy families and for businesses. And one day he was at a board meeting, and the board was debating how to increase deposits of the bank, and he got up and he said, you know, I've got an idea. I grew up on the north side of, of San Francisco in the Italian immigrant community, and every house there, they've got $10,000 under the mattress in cash. Why don't we bank these customers? And according to the story written in the biography of the bank, the other bank directors looked at him like, what are you, nuts? We don't want those kind of customers. To which he got up in this meeting and said, well, if you won't do it, I'll do it. And he walked out, and four months later, he opened the Bank of Italy, which two years later, he renamed to Bank of America. I had set out looking for some paternalistic example of how the big American bank pumped some money for a Chinese school or a hospital. What I found was the story that Bank of America was specifically established to service immigrants in California at a time that no other bank would pay any attention to them. And that generated what was arguably one of the most impactful brand campaigns, image campaigns my agency has ever created, it was print only. We had him, A.P. Giannini, standing in front of the first branch of Bank of America with a headline that said, we started here the same way as you. And it goes on with this very emotional language to say, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, starting in a new country is difficult, you know, with our hopes and our dreams. In 1904, the son of immigrants established a bank in California for immigrant families like his own, da, 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 da. It's not this bank, that bank, it's our bank. What do you? Before 1904, what happened to 1903 this bank? Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, and what we did is, because we were establishing a new brand, at the time they were, I think their brand was Embracing Ingenuity, we said it's not an American bank, it's not an Asian bank, it's our bank. Now, we took this to focus groups, and people got so excited because it was giving them information they didn't know. They started getting up out of their chairs, saying, wow, we didn't know this. We did pre and post tracking. This revolutionized the Asian marketing for the bank. So final couple slides. Cultural relevance has to come into the tracking. I'd be remiss if I didn't say tracking. Whether you're, you're, you've benchmarked and now you're tracking what's going on in your database because you've been able to identify Asians, you could create a mechanism to identify new consumers coming in and flag them as Asians. Some industries uh, will not allow it, but many will. Um, 800 numbers, don't do all of this and then put an English language 800 number for people to respond. Affinity URLs, doing of course tracking research. And if it's retail tracking, like uh, stuff on the shelves of supermarkets, we can do geodemographic analysis to look at the movement of volume. You know, people don't announce when they buy a, a thing of milk that they're Chinese. But we can look at the volumes of products in high-density Chinese zip codes and correlate it with whatever marketing is going on in the market. So I want to end by saying this is definitely all within your reach. And to conclude, I'm going to show you two of the nine TV commercials we created for AT&T as our answer to that Beaches one. 
The first one is going to be in Mandarin Chinese. The second one will be in Vietnamese. I'll follow that with just a one-second comment about each to let you understand the cultural relevance, and then we are done. So just a couple comments. What make those two spots culturally relevant? The Chinese spot, first of all, in traditional Chinese culture, the moon is a widely recognized, the full moon is a widely recognized symbol of people who are intimates or lovers that are separated by great distances. One of the most famous lines of Tang Dynasty poetry is spoken by a traveler who says, who, writing to his beloved on the other side of China saying, well, though we're separated by thousands of miles, I feel close to you because at night we both look at the same moon as if the moon is a conduit for that type of love. So this is an icon that a lot of Chinese people say, oh yeah, of course, the moon, right? There's music going on there. But more importantly, we're showing one of the most common immigration patterns in this community. Not the only one, but a very common one. What's that pattern? A student comes here, often a graduate student, gets a master's, maybe a PhD. During that time studying, interacting with family and significant other overseas. At some point the student graduates, gets 18 months or two years of practical training visa, right? And during that period we'll kind of scramble to find a job that can be used to sponsor a green card. At that point, at some point, the significant other will come, come to the States, maybe to study or maybe to work to join. At some point, these two people will get married. And then a couple years down the road, they'll start having children. And when they start having children, they will start bringing their parents from Asia to here. Why? Because they do not want to hire babysitters that let their kids watch TV all day. Okay? <laughs> and within 10 to 12 years, you now have a landed immigrant family in this country of three generations living under one roof. They bought a more expensive house. They bought the best school districts. And all of these other demographics are coming. That's a very common immigration pattern, not just in the Chinese community, but here. The Vietnamese spot, last comment, Rick, was different. In the research, we, you know, we're looking for some story of empowerment. When we got Vietnamese parents speaking about their lives in the country, one of the things that kept coming out was they said, you you know, we're different from some of the other Asian groups because a lot of us were refugees here. We came here, we were in South Vietnam, we had, pol you know, we haven't been able to go back and forth to Vietnam because of political issues. And because of that, we're very concerned that the children we're raising, that are born and raised in this country and our families, are not able to directly connect with our traditional culture the way other Asian kids, you know, Chinese kids go back to China, Korean kids go back to Korea. A lot of these families were not running back and forth every school holiday taking their kids to Vietnam because they couldn't go back. So they had this real angst about how are our children going to connect with Vietnamese culture. So in this spot, we show how this one little girl was able to connect with some traditional aspect of her culture, small thing, using uh, with AT&T as the <coughs> conduit for discovering that connection. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Hello? Well, how about a hand for Saul Gitlin? There's, there's, a, there's a reason we've had him back all these years, because, uh, and you I want you to translate this in Chinese. You are a bad dude, Saul. <laughs> Isn't he great? <laughs> and you can tell it's, it's not Latino, Latino tradition, it's Asian. We're on time. It's and we're going to go on break, and we're going to and we're going to be back here at 10:30 a.m. sharp because it's LGBT presentation. Let's go out and work with the exhibitors. But again, Sal, thank you, thank you very much.